It's the Benz Brunani woman is Baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this so Sit down, sit down, receive this realness Make sure your cup's ready for the tea We are go sip it, yo Hard time scrolling for your long trots You might learn something you never know Collect you find And she's one of a kind Don't say you mind, say you mind who will buy these beautiful straws, babe? Who will say suck your mom today? Who will buy these beautiful straws, babe? And dash them in the air for me. <laughs> 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 welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of SYM, officially known as Say Your Mind, unofficially known as What What That's Right, Suck Your Mum. And you're with me, Kalechi, just a baby girl. I'm really excited this week because I've got another baby girl. I've got another baby girl in the studio. I've got Annabelle, Annabelle, show where we. Annabelle Shawemi, Annabelle <laughs> Shawemi, a whole Yoruba, a whole Yoruba, and I cannot pronounce. Wow. We got there. We got there. We got, we got there. there. It's because I was eating crisps before. Yeah, blame the crisps. <laughs> <laughs> no, Annabelle is a proper, proper baby girl. She's a doctor, She's a doctor, and not just any doctor, but you're an OBGYN. So sexual and reproductive health. Wow. So we do um, a bit of OBGYN at the beginning mm-hmm. and then we just focus on gynae and sexual health. Gynae and sexual health. So that's gynecologist. For you people that don't know short abbreviations, gynecology and sexual health. That's, that's, that's the focus here. And why is Annabelle here? Because I just feel like a baby girl of baby <coughs> girls, like um, she's pretty much my share your magnificence for... Today, because I, I, I'm all about championing black women who are doing incredible things and they're doing it and some of us aren't even noticing and we need to notice because they're really out here doing it for our sake. So we're not out just out here in the wilderness without the information that we really, really need. So without even, you know, I'm, you're not going to really get a share your magnificence today because Annabelle is the share your magnificence. Mm-hmm. So um, Annabelle, yes. tell us about you. Okay, that was so sweet. By the way. That was like, I'm, like, I'm gonna just be gassed off that for um, at least two weeks. Like, Yay, says I'm magnificent. Um, but any, yes, so as you said, um, I'm a community sexual reproductive health trainee. Mm. <clears throat> um, I was like raised and went to uni in London. I now mainly work in Leicester. Mm -hmm. So I go between both um, running something called Decolonizing Contraception, Mm. um, which I started a year ago, working with other um, people of colour that work in sexual reproductive health, Mm. basically to discuss um, the colonial history um, of sexual reproductive health. Mm. Although there's lots of it within medicine that mm-hmm, we can learn mm-hmm. about. But I thought, let me focus on what I know. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also it is really, really dominant within sexual reproductive health and use that as a starting point to have discussions about the huge health disparities mm. in sexual reproductive health mm. and learn more about why people of colour don't want to engage with services mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or struggle to engage with services. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. this is a trend that we've seen um, in um in britain as as well as globally for a while Mm -hmm. so it's just trying to make sense of that and and also try and motivate people to do research that is useful Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for my community Mm -hmm. and other communities so yeah that's what that's what i'm doing that's wonderful and so now can you see that it makes sense i just didn't i didn't just invite annabelle because she's a pretty face you know and gorgeous (laughs) hair with dorcas you know beautiful dorcas creates earrings no it's because Annabelle knows all of the things. She knows the things and she wants to share the things. And I think that, you know, there are there are there are podcasts, there are brands out there who I, I think are wonderful and they discuss sex a lot, but then we discuss sex and we don't discuss the 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 nuances, the nuances and the intricacies that are so involved when we're talking about sexual health. And um, how can we talk about sexual liberation without talking about the actual sexual health? Because that is intrinsic in all of it and you for me the podcast is all about like 
baby boys, baby girls, baby non-binaries live your best life, but can you live it safely? Um, Woo, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and and that's why when we had a chat, because we uh, basically had our conversation at, when we went to the NAS. Yeah. Black and Brilliant, was it called? Yes, Brilliant, yes. You know? Yeah, and that, Big Up NAS, that was, that was, big a, up NAS. that was a really nice um, event. And we got talking there and we were pretty much chatting the whole night because I'm so intrigued by what you do and how with me and the podcast it's all about decolonizing so many aspects of our lived experience yeah. so with you having this niche as it were of decolonizing you know sexual health and contraception and things like that I think that that is important people who have the knowledge and using it in specific fields um so I was reading on Galdem, I was reading your piece because I was fangirling and I was just like, well, Thank let me you. read what Annabelle's <laughs> saying. Um, so I was, let me bring it up. So the bit I was reading, well, I'll start from the beginning. So this is, if you want to read more of um, Annabelle's work, it's on galdem.com and it's hashtag decolonizing contraception, how reproductive medicine has been used to oppress people of color. When I saw that title, I was like, me and Annabelle are going to be best friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it says, uh, decolonizing contraception is a movement that aims to promote discussion on how sexual and reproductive health has developed from unethical medical research, often on colonized populations. As part of the Galdem hashtag decolonizing contraception series, we will uncover the colonist... Um, a history of contraception, discuss modern contraceptive methods and start a conversation about our daily contraceptive struggles. This series is about helping those ac um, accessing contraception and other sexual health services to feel empowered to make informed choices and strive for reproductive justice, even if you practice abstinence. Why that bit? Because I think in a lot of um, <clears throat> people of colour communities, whether it be because of religious reasons or other things, people don't necessarily become sexually active until later mm -hmm, necessarily mm -hmm. or, or marriage. And then what happens is people think these conversations don't relate to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't engage with it. Mm. They don't think about it until, you know, they're married and they're much older. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I almost feel like it's too late wow. to, to, to navigate some of the nuances. You know, they've never really discussed contraception before. Now they're having to choose from all these methods. None of them work with them. They don't know how to negotiate condom use with a possible unfaithful spouse. Hey, all wow. of these kind of things. Condom, -er. Annabelle. <laughs> Annabelle brought us condoms today. So I, I, message me so I can I can be emailing or not even email. How can I email the condom to you? Do you have a digital penis? But um, <laughs> let me send you some. So Annabelle has brought um, condoms into the uh, studio today. Decolonizing contraception is written on them. So message me, send me a message on sym at kelechiokafor.com and I will be sending you these condoms so we can support Annabelle's movement. That's what we need to be doing, decolonizing contraception. But talk to me more about the unfaithful partners because this is what <laughs> I think is wild. When we were at NAS, we were hearing the stats and... Um, about heterosexual um, relationships and the rise in STIs yeah. and, 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 and the stigma that's been attached to the LGBTQ community that, oh, you guys are the ones with the diseases. We don't roll that way, but it's just like, no, but if we're looking at black and brown people um, who are in what they deem, whatever, mm -hmm. heterosexual relationships, the rise is mad, but everyone's swearing that they're faithful. Everyone's swearing that this and that. And I just think that how, how is that? How is that possible? So I think across the board, um, so for people that don't know, NAS is um, a sexual health charity that focuses on BAME, sexual mm. health, um, and it's been established for a few decades now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think since the 80s, so they're doing really good work and they put an event together for <clears throat> young, black and brilliant people yes. for us to come together and, and talk about these things. Um, so in terms of... Um, the the stats and the, the disparity, um, especially amongst um, black and people of colour um, I think regardless of sexuality they're mm -hmm. much higher yes first of all. across so the board across, across, yeah. across the board they're much higher and there's so much going on there and still the research we have as to why is actually really limited mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we think that you know for example that black men struggle to negotiate condom use or there's poorer sex education in some communities because it's stigmatised well there's the black men are struggling to negotiate well I think it's possibly they say they don't want to use it okay, and then their okay. partners are not um, able to kind of empowered oh. enough to say, actually, we need to use this mm. or question if that part 
um, they're being faithful. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. just because of how conversations are structured in communities mm-hmm. um, about patriarchy. Um, yeah, patriarchy has a lot to play within sexual reproductive health. Obviously, it's mm. a it's a powerful force, mm. um, <clears throat> and we have to have conversations around that. Um, and then specifically, so next girl them article is actually really focused on the needs of LGBTQI non-binary people mm-hmm. and how we've constructed those identities within mm-hmm. within our own communities. Um, so I think because of the stigma specifically faced mm-hmm. amongst people of colour for mm-hmm. those communities, mm-hmm. there is disparity there because people feel that they can't access services mm-hmm. because of stigma. Um, as a black queer man, um, you know, things like um, being hypermasculine mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is... Uh, almost more over mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bearing so people feel frozen out they mm. can't discuss things so all of those things and all of those intersections of people's identity mm-hmm. make them um make it more difficult for them to navigate services mm. use condoms or get contraception and makes this disparity now the problem is is that we just we know these things because mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. talk to each other in our own communities we yeah. see it every day Mm. but the research still really doesn't reflect what we know we have some information but we need to be better so is that does data collection not even not play a role in that as well because the reason I say that is that when I had my miscarriage last year I felt that it was racialized I felt it was racialized and it was gendered how I was treated in that ordeal in that experience and so me being me I wrote to the parliamentary ombudsman and at first I you know I um I dealt with it in terms of the hospital themselves. And I said that I very much felt like I was being treated like a second rate citizen. And you're wondering why black people don't want to access your services because you're treating us like animals, which is hilarious since it was the, um, you know, primarily women, black women from the Windrush generation who came to help you build your freaking NHS in the first place. But you don't respect our black bodies. And, you know, I wrote and pretty much this in my letter and the head of women's services at the hospital, um, got back to me and she said on this note when you said that this happened at 4:22 yeah you know we can't deny that that did happen we're really sorry about that yet that did happen the nurse did say you know she gave you uh, painkillers and told you that it was going to kick in in about 20 minutes then left your door open and went to the reception area to call the doctor and go yeah i just gave her painkillers but i know it's not going to work what now so that we know that all of those things did happen and we're very sorry that all of those things happened, but we just feel that I, I'm just very disappointed that you would think it's about race, um, which we treat everyone equally. And I said, okay, so what, what, what are your, what are your metrics? What, how do you collect the data to be able to tell me that the satisfaction levels are the same across the board, regardless of the people, the race of the people that use this service? She responded, oh no, we don't have that in place, but I, I just know. Yeah, so this is, so there's so much there. First of all, can I just say, I'm really sorry about your experiences. You. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important that people like yourself and everybody, if they feel capable, mm. <clears throat> and in my writing, I share my own experiences of like mm. contraception, mm. because I think this is part of improving, just talking, mm-hmm. because we don't talk about these things enough. Mm-hmm. Now, miscarriages are something really difficult to go through anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And I've spoken about how in terms of reproductive health and by all means, first of all, all of this stuff I'm talking about, um, I just want to pay homage to the amazing black women and other women of Mm colour that have gone before me that have spoken about this kind of stuff, right? Um, And it's been going on, it has been going on for decades Mm. and for years. So in relation to kind of... um, reproductive health for Mm. women um it's been a long narrative that medical professionals don't treat specifically black women with 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 the care and um compassion that they necessarily treat other patients is it because historically they view us as specimen i think there's some of that and this is what decolonizing contraception is is about and it's about discussing some of the experiments that have been done in the past Mm on 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 black and brown bodies, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and we haven't really fully acknowledged mm-hmm. influence our practice. Um, I think there was a study in the States that, and, and it was, you know, it was a, a small study, but was talking about how clinicians um, didn't seem to think that black patients felt, felt as much pain yeah. and they didn't receive as much pain relief. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and there's an idea, and I've written an article about kind of black women hysteria and fibroids for mm-hmm, black mm-hmm, ballot. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's this idea that we're just really robust. Mm-hmm. Strong and, black and, and, Yeah, and that we'll bounce back. And mm-hmm. I do think that feeds into sometimes how we encounter medical professionals and how we're dealt with. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I experience a lot in my practice. And this is what I'm been trying to talk to other medical students and medical and health professionals about Mm -hmm. that there's certain nuances that you don't see because you're not a person of Mm -hmm, colour. But when I'm left in a room with a patient, Mm. I've had people have a sigh of relief and say to me, oh my God, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah. Or, oh my God, I was so glad in the waiting room when I saw it was you. Yeah. And I'm like, obviously they're not going to say this to you, but I've had patients say, oh, I've come to this clinic three times and each time it's been a man that I thought wouldn't get it. So I've like... Just, I've just yeah, left yeah, 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 yeah. and just like try to come back a different day. And mm. I'm like, this is not just the patients. This is a reflection of us. It's the reflection <laughs> of the service as well. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, I've gone, I've, you know, all the times that I've gone for my checkups and things in the past. And if I've had a white woman, for instance, there's this way that she talks like I'm, an hi- I'm a hypersexual savage that, you know, there are questions that I know that must be asked. Then there are, there's the tonality of the way, in the way that these questions are asked. And then the extra questions or the things that are inferred um so are you in a monogamous relationship yes are you you know do you just have currently one sexual partner yes um is you you, you know are you using a protection yes are you sure wait is, are you sure the next question that you were told to ask me or are you you're are you really pressing upon this thing it's it makes you feel that they're expecting I mean we, we we know already That young black girls Are hypersexualized From a young age They they are treated As if they are women From um, um, a very very young age So when you enter Into these um, services Oftentimes that's What's reflected back to you Like oh I know That you've been A sexual savage From, from ages ago So you know um, Let's get to it then And it's shame I think that that's that If you go to access these services and what you're feeling is shame, you're unlikely to go back. And I don't know if people are listening who've ever lived in like South, Southeast London, primarily like the Camberwell area, but the sexual uh, um, health clinic that we've got is right on like Camberwell, or, or is it Denmark Hill? We're mm-hmm. basically right bang in the middle of Camberwell and all these buses are going by and you've got to like big massive sign and you, you want to walk in and go there. And I know that a lot of people haven't wanted to go in because of the stigmas attached to like going for a checkup, which I think is dumb, but um, they haven't wanted to go in for that reason. And once you enter, you you still feel very, very exposed. And I don't know what can actually be done about that. So it's, it's really interesting because I think these are some of the things that we need to unpack because what works for some people obviously doesn't work for other people. Mm-hmm. And we know that in sexual health mm-hmm. anyway. And we do try and do stuff like user consultations mm-hmm. to build the best kind of service. Mm. But there are things that sometimes happen. For example, <clears throat> um, for example, pharmacy services mm-hmm. where you get, you know, your contraception or your emergency contraception over the counter. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been incidences with, and it came up at one of our recent panel discussions for South Asian women mm-hmm. where the community is small mm. and a lot of their family members or friends <gasps> maybe work in that sector. Oh, you know, they don't want to go access their contraception there. Yeah. And then in within, for, for example, within um, black communities, you know, where again, the community might be small. Mm. Yes, it's nice having a centralized sexual exactly, health clinic. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, if you're from communities like um, a, a bit of gentrification now, but mm. like if you're from like Peckham mm. or you're from, um, you know, you live around Dalston, Ridley mm. Road area, like, and you have a hub like right in the middle, mm. like you're scared that your auntie or yeah. your grandma might see you. So mm-hmm. yes, it's accessible. Um, yes, it's good transport wise. Mm. And it is about balancing those things and understanding the nuances. Um, and then in terms of um, <clears throat> interactions with medical professionals, mm-hmm. and this is some of the work that um, I've tried to start doing with medical students and some universities are, um, depending on who's teaching at mm-hmm. that medical school, mm-hmm. it's all very ad hoc, are really good at starting to discuss these things like mm. cultural awareness and mm. cultural competence and actually discussing things like unconscious bias. Yes. Okay. And I don't think within medicine mm. at the moment, it's been addressed enough on enough of a scale. I think for so long, we've been like, medicine's a really altruistic thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're just trying to do our best. Mm. We're just are trying to heal people. We yeah. don't have any biases. Oh, Historically, yeah. we're like really grounded yeah, exactly. in the art of healing yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. The Hippocratic Oath. Mm. And I'm just like, no, okay, actually, this is not what 
medicine developed from, Mm -hmm. okay? Medicine has quite a long history of interacting with state policies of Mm -hmm. oppression, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being used to oppress people, especially within sexual reproductive health, because it's so political. Mm -hmm. If you can stop people reproducing, you can stop people existing. So, and then when you're focusing that on black and brown bodies, um, trying to control how they reproduce, sterilizing people without their consent in, in many circumstances and things like that, you can't, I can see why people are fearful of um, medicine as it were as a whole thing Because it's just that idea And you know you have older aunties and things who would prefer to cook up a broth And, and sort you out that way <laughs> Because they're scared of going yeah. um, and accessing these services But it reminds me of um, um, a section So you've got the next section um, I'll, I'll let you talk about your mother and how your conversation was with her Um no, actually, I'll, I'll lead on from there so you can build on that. So it says, you said here, several years ago, when I informed my mother that I had a progesterone implant fitted to prevent pregnancy, she stated that I was silly and it would ruin my fertility forever. Untrue. My mother was born in Britain, educated to university level, and yet remained very sceptical about hormonal methods of contraception. It did not matter to her that I was a doctor and well informed of the risks and benefits of the implant and subsequent infertility is definitely not one of them. As far as she uh, she was concerned, I had made a detrimental choice. It may seem easy to dismiss my mother's concerns as an isolated incident, but her anxieties are fueled by stories and rumours passed down through generations, intensified by stories of colonial regimes and Western countries attempting to control the fertility of colonized women. In 2003, the oral polio vaccination campaign in northern Nigeria failed as rumors were rampant that it would spread HIV and cause infertility. Whilst these claims were ludicrous, they were embedded in a long history of dubious colonial and post-colonial practices within this region. So how do we separate the the very very real atrocities that will have been committed and as a result of that trauma is deeply embedded within these communities and and people not wanting to be touched or be ac- you know or access medicine in that way how do we break them apart so i think <clears throat> it's so it's it's something that's been going on for so long that there's not going to be any quick fix there and mm-hmm. people have as i said you know from the work of like combahee river collective to amazing people like audrey lord who've been speaking about reproductive justice for ages mm-hmm. you know um people have been talking about these things and i think it's really important that talking i always think is key yes. okay action does come from talking yes. but just opening up the conversation now and I, and, and part of that is the medical profession having conversations that honestly I don't think they've really been having mm. um you you need to and it's difficult in this climate where you have limited time and mm. limited services mm-hmm. but you need to be able to unpick why somebody doesn't want a certain method mm-hmm. often there's this this um this conversation where it goes the person says I don't want that and then you can ask a really quick question and they're like oh it's my bleeding pattern and then you move on to the next thing or they give some other half-baked excuse Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you only have a finite amount of time but actually what we need is forums and space Mm. and consultation times for us to actually start to address Mm -hmm. what the underlying reasons Mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. and then you can start to unpick it you Mm -hmm. know because people have value-held beliefs that Mm. as I said are rooted it's rooted in in something, something yeah right and if you actually want something to work for example there are sometimes very good reasons why people need to have contraception mm-hmm. you know we know that as you um, have more pregnancies mm-hmm. your risk of um <clears throat> your risk of dying mm-hmm. in childbirth increases right. okay especially if it's older age mm-hmm. as you get older mm-hmm. okay because you're more at risk of having things like bleeding afterwards mm-hmm. or complications mm-hmm. so sometimes it's not clever to have things like multiple c-sections you yes. know it's yeah. risky so you need to take adequate precautions mm-hmm. for example to to not get pregnant mm-hmm. so you can be around for your existing kids yes and these are conversations that we need to have with people, but we need to have them within like a holistic framework because they might want to use something, mm-hmm. but they have all these underlying fears that are not being addressed. And I think that it's the fears and and not just the fears, but the very real things that they're speaking about that a lot of people ignore. So it might sound from the next story that I'm going to say, like I've just had traumatic experiences with, you know, um, sexual health services, but it's actually not the case. Um So I remember around 2009, I would have my period and I'll just get this excruciating pain after my period. So I wasn't really getting period cramps. I was 
it's after that I would get these really, really bad cramps. And so I just thought, mm, something's not quite right here. Something's rather odd. And I had the um, an IUD at that point as well. Yeah. And so anyway, I would just get these really, really bad cramps. It was horrendous. So I went to see my um, GP yeah. and I said, you know, um, I'm, I'm having really, really bad cramps and they come after. I, I made sure to state that they're coming after my period. And he was just like, oh, it's nothing to worry. It was literally like that. Oh, it's nothing to worry about. Go, go, go. go. And he was a Nigerian man and that would come in handy later. So he was like, just go, just go. So it's fine. And so then I told my mum, because I was living with my mum at the time and I was just like, I'm having some really, really bad pains. Um, and they're coming after my period. And my mum was just like, and I said, oh, I told the, our GP about it. And she said, yeah, but you know, like you said, you're the one that's always piercing your body, trying to do, you know, young girl and do hippie girl. And I said, so you and the GP have a convers- have had a conversation about me and you've concluded that it's because I have numerous piercings that somehow my, my, my uterus hurts. I mean, so I, so I, was, <laughs> so, I'm like, I so, so annoyed for you. So I, it was it, the breach of trust. Like there's just the, all of that was, it was apparent. But then I went to um, one of the sexual health clinics and I told them the same thing. And the woman was just like, no, I'm sure it's just, you know, IBS. So I'm sure it's this, so I'm sure it's that. Nobody was taking me seriously until I was like staunchly, First of all, I never want to see that GP again. I went back to the GP practice. I was like, I never want to see him again. And and I actually want to put in a letter of complaint because he violated so many things. Your confidentiality. uh, Yes. Which I think is a really important thing to just point out is that there is doctor-patient confidentiality unless a patient is at risk. Yes. In terms of other things like abuse or Mm -hmm, assault, for mm -hmm. example. And that will be maintained. Right. Especially in sexual health clinics. Right. You know, we don't need to even know your name. But you know, because you're Nigerian, my mum's Nigerian. Yeah, and that's you can really have you, awful. you can you can have a convo about me, and and then say that it's because I I have so many piercings, or you know had so many piercings. So I insisted on seeing another GP. I saw another GP. Um, they referred me. Um. To, to, to be seen And uh, cut a long story short I had a diagnostic laparoscopy And they found like Extensive endometriosis And they said Yeah well that's why You've been feeling the pain And why it's coming after Your period as You know um, The um, endometrium is building back up Yours is You know It's, it's happening outside And everything else um, And you know It was clinging on to like Organs on the outside And they said Oh would you like to have it Operated on And why I say this is because, again, there are cultural impacts to things because I said, I said I'd get back to them on whether I'd have it operated on. And I told my mum and she was like, no, a prayer man said, don't go and operate on it. A prayer man said, leave it alone. Yeah. So I left it. I left it alone. But that was a major risk because of what I'm, you know, I'm speaking to the doctor and she was just like, well, you know, at this point you're 20, what, you're 24. If you plan to have children, you haven't, if you know, if this is the extent of the endometriosis, you you need to, you've only got a small window to consider that. And I just thought that that so many aspects of that I feel feed into why we're not seeing um a lot more black people in these sorts of environments, the the personal relationships that they have in their family, about, you know, like even how your mum was like, why are you going to do that? It's their limited understanding of these things wherever they're educated that I think impacts it as well and I think that is um really important this is the other thing that with the I think um new RSE Mm -hmm. regulations the relationships and sexual education Mm -hmm. that people need to understand that certain groups and need culturally specific sex education Mm -hmm. um because even though you think okay we're born it brought up in Britain Mm. or you know they've been in Britain all the time that they can remember. Mm -hmm. We have so many different other cultural influences Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on how we've come to shape our beliefs. I'm not even saying that these are wrong because, Mm -hmm. you know, you can have intersecting belief systems. And and you have to find what works for you. Mm. However, if we want people to get, you know, important information for their health, Mm. we need to be factoring this in, Mm -hmm. into 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 the context and making sure that people get in the right information Mm. um, in the right way. Um, And I don't think that is currently happening Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's something that is thought about Mm. enough um going back to what you were saying about your diagnosis of endometriosis Mm. so within um the 
colonizing contraceptive kind of collective mm-hmm. we have people that work in um other doctors and other sex educators mm-hmm. and some of them also have endometriosis mm-hmm. and sadly with endometriosis across the board this is a really common narrative mm-hmm. i think the average diagnosis takes eight years <laughs> yeah and i think the reason for that is because regardless there's still this narrative within medicine of like this hysterical woman yes um and oh you're having pelvic pain but no one can see it we can't see anything wrong with you um there's nothing there and then obviously as your as as your mum did point out um a laparoscopy is a fairly minor surgical procedure Mm -hmm. but there are possible big complications Mm -hmm. that could occur Mm -hmm. so because that's like the test that people need to do to see it Mm -hmm. you know people don't go through that necessarily or people don't want to um, necessarily, uh, other doctors might not want to do that test. Mm-hmm. So it's underdiagnosed. Mm-hmm. People find reasons to put it off, put it off, but the patient's in pain mm-hmm. and, you know, they they want answers. Right. <clears throat> um, so I do think there needs to be wider discussions, to be honest, about like how this bias Mm -hmm. that we have um, when we look at a patient and people are doing this mental arithmetic in their mind about like, how real their pain is because mm-hmm. you can't see anything mm. causing their pain and um, how you put that on the patient, mm. what the patient looks like, mm. their interaction with you. They can't really be in pain because she's handling it too well. Mm-hmm. And you have to make a judgment call, mm. but I don't think we interrogate our own biases enough. Enough. Like mm. I've had people say things like, mm. oh, she's complaining so much about those blood tests, but she's got so many piercings. And I'm like, they're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're not the same. I've also heard people say things like, you know, oh, she's got a tattoo. Like, I don't understand how she can, you know. Or I've actually heard people yeah. say to the patient, you've got a tattoo. So, you know, why, why are you complaining? Why you, yeah. why can't you handle this? I'm sure it's not as bad as that massive tattoo you've got on your back. And I'm thinking in my head, this is for me, you're it's mad. really you're, inappropriate. You're fucking mad. You're fucking it's, just, mad. it's just really inappropriate. Yeah. I'm like, <clears throat> they're not the same level of pain. Yeah. Um, the patient might be in a different, a complete different space to they were then. Different state um, of mind. Mind your business. And I think there's lots of little things that happen, you know, and I think we do need to have better training around like unconscious bias yeah. as well as obviously we need actual training about like racism mm. and colonial practices that have brought us to this place where this is, there is this distrust that people just don't speak about mm. um, amongst um, black and people of color, mm-hmm. you know, where they are wary mm. that you're best in, you don't necessarily have their best interests at heart. Mm-hmm. And obviously this is not everybody, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But I do think it's something that's just like really not, not discussed enough. Mm-hmm. No, I, I I really agree. And it's like you said, my, one of my things when I went and I saw the IBS, the woman that said, oh, it's probably IBS. Um, the first thing she said to me was like, but you're so athletic looking, look so strong. I just, are you, how painful is it really? How painful is it really? <laughs> and I, it's it's painful. I, I told you, I, I just told you, but it's so, so what do you do? You, you're really into fitness, I imagine. Stop changing the subject. I just told you that this is what's happening. Let's stick to this. But again, it, it felt like everybody was gaslighting me about something that I knew wasn't right. And had I not insisted, like you said, maybe I would have been out there for like eight years. I mean, it took me, so with saying I started complaining about it in 2009, I didn't have the um, laparoscopy until about late 2010. So, but it was just because I was just, every other month I was back there. I was back there. And and some people just don't have that energy. So then they're, they're unaware of these things or they're unaware that these things are happening inside <coughs> themselves until maybe they see some really major outward symptoms. And the thing is, is that it's all well and good for people to say, you know, oh, maybe you're, I don't know, whipping people up or getting people worried. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, if you look at the actual statistics mm-hmm. across reproductive health for black women, and um, other women of colour, they are worse. They're worse. You know, black women specifically, you know, they they present later for um, gynecological cancers. Yeah. They, you know, they they tend to present when things are advanced, partly because, you know, we don't, um, we, we have lower smear uptake rates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, lots to be said about that. Still quite under-researched area yeah. about as to why. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Although there are a few reasons, maybe, you know, invasive area, lack of obviously trust. Um, Then there's other overlapping issues such as um, 
some of these women have had a, been abused. They mm-hmm. don't want to have a smear test or, you know, they've got things like FGM. Mm-hmm. So there are these other reasons, but I do think that we need to really um, have a look at, you know, this massive disparity we have in reproductive health mm-hmm. um, for black women and say, actually, we need to be teaching women to advocate for themselves more. Because I do think there's probably a lot of women saying, oh, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, repeatedly on mm. attendances, or, oh, this discharge is weird, it's weird, it's weird. And they're not necessarily getting the referral when they should, mm-hmm. or um, people aren't taking them seriously because of all these other things, you know, these these biases that people have. And, you know, you, mm. you often have to call it what it is. There is also just racism. Yeah, there, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> where people just... <clears throat> Uh, are less interested or think they can provide a lower standard of care to certain demographics of patients because they're, you know, less Mm. well-educated, they're they're, they're black, and they think that 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 doesn't need to be their priority. And that's and that's the problem. And we, when um, you and I were speaking at the NAS event, we we also spoke about the online services now, where you can order the pack to your um your home. And that's what I actually said to you because I've noticed that the funding has gone down in terms of the number of sexual health clinics that one can actually go and access physically. Yeah. And 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 that's now proving a you know that's a problem as well. Um. So the last time I wanted to get a checkup, I actually just ordered the pack online and it was sent to me. But even that I found odd because then you've got to take a blood sample of yeah. yourself. And mine was just coming out like double. Yeah. I mean, I've been there this? too, you know, like I feel like if you're advising people to use stuff and also I consider myself still a reasonably young person. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I've tried one of those. And as uh, you know, I almost felt like, can I just bleed myself? <laughs> you know, like This would be less arduous if I could just literally bleed myself yeah. and put it in the bottle. Yeah. I was like, oh, and now it's clotted. Yes, and then, yeah, oh yeah. my gosh. And squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. I mean, I think we talked about this before a bit, but I think they're really good for some people that cannot, you know, they're fairly, they're, they're fairly low risk Mm -hmm. in terms of, and they don't have any questions and they've got busy lives and busy jobs. Mm -hmm. It's really great to, I guess, be able to pop online, get a kit Mm. and, um, get, get results, Mm. um, in the next week or whatever mm-hmm. without that face-to-face interaction yeah. um but then yes of course there were going to be people that have questions mm. their lives are more complicated you need to discuss loads of other things mm. they may have been assaulted they may still have ongoing abuse they might have you know all these other things and obviously that is not going to be appropriate mm. means of, of screening and you told me something really interesting about pregnancy because some women wait until pregnancy because they think that all of these checks will be done um but actually they don't screen for certain things so yeah so this is another thing i think a lot of women um are not always clear what they're being screened for i think men as well okay Mm -hmm, so there's mm -hmm. this idea that when somebody takes a blood test i've had this before Mm. when i um, have said somebody do you want a high hiv and syphilis Mm. test um and they say and i'm like have you been tested before and they're like yeah i must have been tested i was feeling tired uh, a a year ago my gp did blood tests and i'm thinking to myself you don't actually know what test you took (laughs) and you know generally someone would probably tell you that they were taking this test and that was no actually that was just a full blood count a Mm. normal regular blood test so I think that often happens so in terms of pregnancy um women are generally screened for things that are transmissible Mm, to the the baby baby. so most women will have hiv syphilis testing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um most under 25s will be screened um by their midwives for gonorrhea and chlamydia Mm -hmm. um but that and then um over that most women will be offered that swab as well Mm -hmm. it doesn't always happen Mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. and i think sometimes women think that they've been screened and they haven't been screened Mm. um or they you know had discharge in pregnancy and people take um all those swabs but they don't do those ones because Mm. you know it's an awkward conversation to have maybe with a pregnant woman but then i'm i'm often actually think in my mind that i this is anecdotal to be honest, mm. um, there might be statistics around this. I do think from the few cases I've seen that some women are actually more likely to cr- contract STIs in pregnancy because oh. they're pregnant and their partner, you know, sometimes it's like, 
unfaithful. Um, you know, uh, Tristan because Thompson. <laughs> the woman's heavily pregnant. Maybe yeah. it's like not convenient for yeah. them to be having sex. They don't feel sexy yeah, yeah. or whatever. And I'm like, actually, that for me is a time where you should be vigilant. You should be vigilant. You know, and if that one might need rescreening, even if she was screened at the beginning, that's because in nine months. Who the, knows? Her whole body changes. Her whole life could have yeah. changed. And if she's telling you she feels like something is abnormal down below, mm. then then she needs she she needs a she needs a swap. That's so interesting. <laughs> and I don't. That, yeah. Why not? Why? Yeah. But what what advice then would you give to um, first of all the under twenty fives? How especially the 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 black girls? How they should be. Um, Operated when it comes to this You know Talking about sex And things like that Because you mentioned That when you were In your dorms If I'm not mistaken You had a bowl (laughs) 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 Yes And And I think that That's incredible I think that's amazing And And we talk about empowering. We talk about how patriarchy is inextricably linked to the reasons that we're not having these conversations. But the only way that we can overcome this is to start doing things like having a condom bowl and and letting people infer what they want to infer. But the fact is that it's, it's, there. it's there. So when I was at university, I was at uni for a really long time because I did medicine and mm. then <clears throat> I did a degree in medical anthropology in between. Wow. <laughs> I now do master. I've just been at uni forever, I feel mm. like. But... Um, we, my flatmates and I, because I used to run a global health society, we used to get loads of free stuff. So mm. um, for one of our events, I got loads of free condoms and we just had it in a bowl mm. in our, and we just had it there actually, um, just because that's where I was storing it. Mm-hmm. But then actually it was just a really good thing because it was there. There were always condoms there mm-hmm. um, and, you know, you could go and grab it. It also destigmatized it. Obviously we had like friends drop over or male mm. friends and they would like, you know, make jokes about, oh, what are you girls up to? Mm. So much action because yeah. you've got this bowl. And I'm like, let's just take the stigma away. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's there. So some somebody in the house may be having sex or have a regular partner. Someone might not be having any sex. Yeah. Okay? But there are condoms there. You know where they are. Mm. There's no excuse for not for not using them because they're available. And if one splits, there's another one there for you to go and continue. And it's just about making it easy, you know, because then also when you bring somebody over, it's there. And I know lots of people listening are going to be like, oh, but then he's going to think I'm a, when we have our condoms on us or our condoms are there, they think us, think we're a hoe. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's all of this, like this rhetoric. And I'm, I have to say again and again, and this is what I've, I've also said to men, Mm -hmm. you know, that actually, to be honest, you should think that girl is safe. Yes. Okay. And sensible. Yes. What is more worrying, actually, is if somebody does not discuss condom use yeah. at all yeah. with you. Because, you know, once you sleep with somebody unprotected, you slept with some every other person yeah, yeah, yeah. that they've had sex with. Yeah. So actually, you should be commending that woman or that man mm. for being sensible they're not yeah. accusing you necessarily of being unfaithful they're being sensible yeah and we know under 25s um <clears throat> i think there was this statistic i can't really remember i think i think it's accurate but i can't remember where i've got mm-hmm. it from but i was taught it in a lecture so i think it holds true mm. that um amongst under 25s mm. um just the general population mm-hmm. The rate, the likeliness of contracting chlamydia Mm. is higher than contracting chlamydia from a sex worker, actually, because sex workers are very good at getting their checks regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, These, and obviously, there's different types of sex workers, Mm -hmm. but. um, uh, sex workers are often very good at getting regular checkups. They, they're specialist clinics in a lot of sexual health mm. services to meet their needs. And the messaging has kind of got through mm. to to sex workers that they should should be safe and negotiate condom mm-hmm. use. But then you have this general population that are still, you know, don't want to talk about sex, mm. don't want to negotiate condom use, mm. don't feel empowered mm. to negotiate condom use. And the message hasn't gone through. Mm-hmm. So actually the risk is really high. Um and then just on just another thing in terms of like message to young black um, men and women listening, um, 
the rates of, you know, like getting gonorrhea, I think are like 10 times higher in the black Whoa, community and things. And people, people don't think, people think, oh, I'll just get a shot mm. or I'll just have some tablets and then it will go away. And I'm like, that's true. However, the problem is, is that you don't get symptoms as a woman, mm. um, like 80%, 90% of the time. Mm. And it lingers there. And a lingering chlamydia infection can cause infertility problems. Wow. It can block your tubes. And each time you get it, the risk of you having subsequent infertility issues goes up. Uh. And the saddest thing for me is when I've seen women with infertility issues mm. that have had really bad um pelvic inflammatory disease yeah. which is like an infection that yeah. happens following chlamydia and it's not you don't always have pain or uh, or discharge or whatever mm. you can silently have PID mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and go on to develop infertility issues mm. and then it gets to the stage in their life where they want to have a child, have, have yeah. a child and you know they've got their tube is blocked oh. because of this bad bout of chlamydia they had yeah. when they were younger and it's just you know when you're young you don't really think about these yeah, things yeah. Um, a lot of your actions you don't really think have like consequences mm -hmm. um but unfortunately you know sometimes they do mm. um and it's about having sex that's great and that's um pleasurable but you know it's also safe and I always feel like if you can't have certain conversation with certain people mm -hmm. about using a condom or contraception I just I'm not maybe sure you, you should sex yeah with I'm Don't not sure you that. should be having sex what, with that person what, what about the people who are in relationships <clears throat> you get some of the people who were just like you know once I'm married it's no holds barred we're gonna live our best lives you know it's just me and my boo and then they don't get tested again so this is the thing if you look I've been in long-term relationships and um, after a while because people say it feels better it ruins the moment mm. all of that kind of thing which is fair mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, there, there is aspects of that or well, some people you know they, even though they use latex free condoms it causes irritation mm -hmm. that kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's not it's not conducive in a long-term relationship that's fine but as you said you know I think it's sensible and no sexual health clinic is going to turn you away if you get checked, like I get an annual checkup. You I just, just, I, I just think in, it's common sense. You just like, drop in, you get a checkup. And yeah. it's not accusing your partner. Of it's anything. just yeah. being sure and safe for yourself, you know? And um, I've had it in clinic where like other clinicians or doctors like have been like reluctant to offer an older woman testing because she like might get offended or I just, and I just caveat it. I say, I offer everyone screening, mm -hmm. you know, because at the end of the day, it provides peace of mind. Yeah. If you don't want that screening, That's that is on your entirely head yeah. up to you. Mm -hmm. But I think it is just sensible um, because obviously things get overlooked. People have a lingering infection. Mm -hmm. Um, and sadly, some of these infections, for example, you know, syphilis, if mm. it's lingering, actually can have really awful complications yeah. 10 years down the line. In the in the first, you know, um, first initial infection in the first year or so, you can just get a, an injection yeah. and it's gone. Yeah. But then if you leave it, you've not Man. been tested, yeah. really serious repercussions. I think it's important, especially older women, um, older women and Nigerian women, not even to be black or Nigerian. Why are you always talking about Nigeria? Older <laughs> Nigerian women, I think you should because when you've got these, you know, we know the narrative of, of these husbands having girlfriends and doing baby boy in the streets. Like, you know, it's just do it. Just do it. And I, I'm so particular about my sexual health. And um, I've been, what, in my relationship six years and I still go for an annual checkup. I just I just feel like it's, why not? Why not? It's just another thing that I've ticked off. I don't want to be 15 years down the line and I'm looking back like, when last did I go? No, at least I know. You know, it's the same with smear tests, like set an alarm if, you know, like, you know, put it in my calendar Like, okay, this is the next time I'm going to have a smear test In this um, next few years At least, you know, these things are on there You just need to take it seriously Because <coughs> if you're telling me that they only added the clitoris And this is what I learned from Jendela a while back That they only added um, the clitoris to medical journals Absurdly late 
Like it wasn't actually part of diagrams because what it was, why are we putting it in? The entire clitoris, you, it was an <laughs> afterthought. I'm not trusting anybody else um, to remind me of these things. Let me remind myself and get things done because, yeah. you know, that translates, of, if that's what's happening in the medical world, that translates into our world, like people not taking it seriously, and not the woman's genitalia. I think it's also just genitalia. really important to point out on this note um, that I think pe- a lot of people still think that you have to be examined to have a sexual sexual health screen for mm. gonorrhea and chlamydia you can do a swab yourself Sim- if you haven't got any symptoms and it works just as well yep. so it's literally just like waving a cotton bud in your vagina done you know so it's quite a straightforward so rapid straightforward, thing yeah. um and i think it's just yeah it's really it's just a peace of mind thing yeah. rather than having something there that is lingering potentially causing you damage yeah I to me it's just another part of life admin you know I go and get my teeth checked go and get my eyes checked get my ears checked why don't you just check your pussy like it, to me it's just just check all of the things like people are people will take their cars for checks more than they take themselves and I just think that that's that's wild like it's wild <laughs> yeah I mean I think that um Often it's someone was like to me, there's another thing that I like get quite <clears throat> I get quite hecked up on. Mm. Um, and we've discussed um all the other nuances and important parts of sexual health mm. um throughout the talk. Mm. But there's this other narrative of what I like to call sexy sexual health mm. that is kind of like booming at the moment, where it's like so I think I'm really into like sex positivity. Yes. One of our other panels was about sexual well-being and pleasure. And we mm-hmm. had some great panelists um, that, you know, work around those areas mm-hmm. talking about um, how to improve that for, for all genders mm-hmm. and all of that kind of thing. So that is really important. But there's this whole narrative that, you know, people talk to me about the sexual health clinic and go in there and they're like, oh, only dirty, naughty people go oh. there. Do you know what I mean? And just like, I'm just like, I'm just like, no. This whole sexy sexual health narrative like really needs to kind of die a death, okay? Like sex is like very functional. Yes, it can be sexy. It's also deeply unsexy sometimes because it's often, it can be linked with other things like poverty, yes. you know? People don't go and get a checkup because they don't have time. Their jobs are all consuming. Yeah. They don't have the education. Someone having bulky warts or a purulent penis mm. that is not sexy sexual yeah, health yeah. and it's also not something to be stigmatized or t- yep. taboo it's yep. like any yep. other medical issue Condition. yeah you know and i think that's sometimes what causes some of these problems you mm. know some people within the community don't want to go to the clinic because they associate the sexual health clinic with like all this other extreme of sexual health yeah, where yeah. it's like porn and oh ah don't do that you naughty boy and I'm just like I'm like oh it's also just a health clinic okay where there are lots of doctors and nurses and and um counsellors who have trained for years yeah um like any other specialist yeah, service. Exactly. And I'm sorry, but some of my consultants are deeply unsexy beings. Yeah. Okay, like, <laughs> like you'd see any doctor, they mm. are very beige. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And they're just there to provide a service. Mm. And there is nothing sexy about the yeah. interaction. <laughs> and I so, wouldn't want it to be. You know, yeah. it's just, you know, I've had very weird questions like, oh, but don't your partners get jealous that you have to examine patients? I was like, no, no. because... You know, I'm oh. not assaulting my patients. <laughs> I'm taking specimens yeah. for an examination to mm. diagnose them with a condition. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another thing that needs to kind of be unpacked as well. That yes, there are other things that can be discussed in a sexual health clinic, like psychosexual issues yes. that are under discussed in our communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, things like uh, sexual abuse or assault support that you need around those things mm. um and th- it's it's not this sexy it or please. dirty yeah, we or don't need it. taboo place mm. it's a place of health and well-being yeah and somebody trying to take care of your holistic needs yeah, yeah yeah no i'm really glad you came to chat with me about this today because i just all of it is so necessary and there's still so many things that we could cover about it um but I, I just think it, I just, to me, it was just important because I just saw all of this flying around. Like everyone's having conversations about sex, but I just didn't know how much of it was well informed or stats being thrown around in order to validate some of the things and threads and things that are being written. But how much of an understanding is there about the stats and things like that? So when you and I spoke, I was just like, please, Annabelle, <laughs> please come and just come and tell the people them. Come and let the people them know. Um, so no, I really, really appreciate that you do that. 
Thank you so much. Um, just on the stats issue, there's mm-hmm. just like um, another thing that comes up quite frequently, I think. And it is clear that black women specifically struggle with, I think, um, using longer, more robust methods of contraception, mm-hmm. like the IUD or the implant, like mm-hmm. we discussed mine earlier, because the rates of repeat abortion mm-hmm. amongst black women is is significantly higher wow. compared to white or Asian women mm-hmm. in the UK. So we tend to have ex- uh, consecutive abortion rates. Mm-hmm. Um, and whatever your views are on okay, that, on yeah. that um, I think it's really important that knowing that each time for some women not all women but Mm. it's emotional toll Mm -hmm. right and i think we need to have a discussion about why such women are struggling Mm. to like use a method Mm. that works for them um i think this also go hand in hand with other statistics that show um so the nat cell survey which is like the national sex and lifestyle survey Mm -hmm. it's like the biggest sexual health survey that gives us a lot of information it happens um (laughs) I think it's every it's every 10 years. Um, okay. So another one is due soon. But the last one showed that black women also have the highest use of um, oral emergency contraception. Ah. Oh. Um, so we use emergency contraception. And a lot of women, I think, think it's actually a form of contraception. Mm. I've had women say, I've said to them, what contraception are you on? And they're like, oh, I take the emergency contraceptive pill. And I'm like, that's you not... You didn't hear the emergency. <laughs> I'm like, that's <laughs> not regular <laughs> contraception. Wow. Um, and then I think, obviously that feeds into people, you know, having to have, you know, terminations or having unplanned pregnancies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we need to have have some more conversations about what is making that difficult. Mm. Um, and also our understanding of emergency contraception, because I think that is just really poor. Mm-hmm. Like women don't understand how it works in terms of your menstrual cycle. Yeah. It delays ovulation. Yeah. If you have an irregular cycle or you've already ovulated, mm-hmm. that contraception, that it's, emergency it's contraception, it's not really yeah. going to work, yeah. you know? And I've had women say, oh, I've taken it multiple times in a cycle, which you actually can do. Yeah. But like having very little understanding of where they are in their yeah, cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then not understanding that that worked for that episode. So actually now you're, if you have unprotected sex again, you're at subsequent risk, risk yeah. you know, and you don't know when you're going to ovulate. So this has got very messy. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I just think there's still quite a lot of work to be up. So we have some statistics. Mm. Um. There's still a lot more statistics we need, I think, in understanding the whys Mm -hmm. behind this. Mm. Um, We have things that show a disparity. Like, Mm. we know our STI rates are higher. We know black women are at high risk of dying in childbirth by, like, five. um, Yeah, I think it's five by the latest. It's gone down? I think it's not going down. (laughs) Actually, I think that's that's higher. Because they said seven times for black women, four times more for for white, uh, for for Asian Asian women women. in comparison to white women. Okay, so maybe it's gone up again. I don't know. I thought that that might have been to this. I'm talking about the Embrace 2016 Oh, no, no, no. So there might be, in the this one, it might have gone worse since then. But it's significantly... But thank you so much. (laughs) Great that it's going up. (laughs) (laughs) It's significantly higher. So we Mm. know, but then there's not really more discussions about the whys. And Mm. I don't think we... Another issue, and this is something about decolonizing the academy, Mm. we don't have enough Black or people of colour researchers Uh that are interested in not actually I think the interest is there but that are being funded to explore these issues Mm. and I do think because of what we've discussed there are nuances when you are researching as um, somebody that comes from a community Mm -hmm. often there's some stuff that where you could say clouds your judgment and you're less objective and that kind of thing but you could but but they also provide provide insight insight into your analysis and like how to interact with the user yes. and how to extract certain information. Yeah. And anybody that is interested about those kind of things, there's a fantastic book that I think was put out by Zed Books called Decolonizing Methodologies, Ooh. which was um, actually written like over maybe even 20 years ago, but they did an update recently. Mm-hmm. And that is a fascinating read for mm-hmm. anybody that is actually interested in like well, doing thank you. more like decolonizing methodologies. methodologies. That's, yeah. yeah, I'm going to. Oh, oh. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. So uh, for those who are probably crying by now, you didn't do the tarot. Shut if you don't shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the tarot is coming. I will never forget. So um, this week, Annabelle is going to pick our cards for us. Ooh, I'm um, cleanse them, prayed over them already. So um, just 
you ch- f- think about so the question. Shiny. These are gorgeous. Oh These are by Crystal Banner. She's a baby Ooh. girl. Um, so we'll start with this, and you've got three cards to shuffle. So you can okay. just shuffle them, hold them, and just what, have shuffle a, the whole deck. Yeah. Okay. And just I'm have so a bad thing. At shuffling. <laughs> so, you know, I used to try and practice when I was younger. You know, like do you pretend you're a magician, and you're like, no, it's not. I'm it's not. not it's not. not it's not working for okay. me. Just do my random shuffle. Okay. But have a thought about something. What you'd like us to address, or whatever is on your mind, in your heart. My heart, in my life. Mm. Um, okay. Good, and you can pick out three cards. Okay, can I pick from the bottom? Whichever you want, wherever it feels like you want to pick from. Please, please be, please be nice to me. <laughs> please, please don't drag me, please. I need, I need, please. I need good vibes. I'm just a baby week. girl. Good right, Three vibes. cards. And then um, if you pick a card. One card from here for me from the Say Your Mind Affirmation card deck. Big up all the people who are still sending me uh, pictures every day of your, or every week of your Say Your Mind Affirmation uh, cards. I really, really appreciate it. I I love that you're you're still using them because I use mine um, every week as well. Just pick out a card um, as a theme for the week and then one of these. So this, uh, the new Oracle cards that I've got are from the Sacred Symbols uh, Oracle deck by Marcella Kroll. If you want to get that, she's, I think these cards are wonderful. Perfect. So let's see what we've got. So let me just put this here. Needs good advice. <laughs> <Good laughs> so let's see. So the first card we've got, I'll turn these up because I think I gave them to you. Upside down. Oh, okay. So maybe that one wanted to be that way as well. King of Wands. And then strength in reverse. Interesting. That's so funny. Um, so what we've got here, we've got the uh, we've got the king of uh, sorry, the queen of wands. We've got the queen of wands in reverse. We've got the devil. And we've got and we've got the strength card in reverse. So um, what were you thinking about? <clears throat> so a couple of things, some random things, mm. actually. So more coming out of our conversation, mm. I'm thinking more about my next girl than piece, which is on like um, LGBTQI non-binary people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole debate that happened around, you know, sex ed mm-hmm. <clears throat> and how we really need to change the narrative within our communities. Mm. Um so that piece basically goes into how colonial laws implemented anti-homosexual laws in a lot of the continent. Mm-hmm. And it was just talking about how one of the things I'm really, I think we need to just keep talking about is how actually um, we had this really rich gender and sexuality tapestry mm-hmm. pre-colonialism. Mm-hmm. And I just want to keep talking about that more. And, okay. Yeah. And our next events on that. So it's basically hoping that that's going to be a good positive po- positive experience. experience that's yeah. wonderful that you say that because actually what comes up from the cards for me, what I'm feeling for you is that this idea of imposter syndrome that you just mentioned in passing when we were talking earlier, mm-hmm. that you don't feel equipped to be the one that is having these conversations with people because you are the queen of wands. This is the card, the queen of wands. You've got fire energy. You're very, very good at nurturing people and putting and and putting things firmly in place and creating foundations. Like it really burns from deep within. Like that's what you're about. But it came up upside down because it's like you're not believing in that power at the moment. You you know it's there, but you're just not utilizing that fire energy. And I think I probably even spoke about this fire energy last week, but um or two weeks ago. So you're not utilizing the energy and it's it's something that you need to address because the the two other cards that came up were major arcana cards. So this is a minor arcana, and two major arcanas came up. Um, so these are major life energies, and this is a um, you know like a day to day sort of energy. Okay. So this is something that's in in essence is something that you can you can you can work and it yeah and and you can okay. and it can transition through and probably you go in and out of that state okay. um where you use the power and then you come away from it but then the devil card says <laughs> I that, that. I was like, <laughs> Jesus! Jesus! um but the devil card came up because um it, it's it goes deeper than that it's it's more of an it's more of an addictive manner of thinking about yourself that is asking you to address like you're bound. If you see in the card, for those who can't see the card, you're bound by the thoughts. Um, and 
it's important for us to be aware of our shadow selves and be aware of the parts that harbor self-doubt and harbor these things. But when you give them power over you, then what happens is that you get the strength card because your strength card, which is another major arcana, came up in reverse as well. So, and that's in it's, you know, it's got the sign of eternity there as well. So you're between the queen of wands in reverse, the strength card in reverse, you've got the devil upright, which is saying to me that this is the most powerful energy that's working in within um, your energy field at the moment. This idea of self- I love you're trying to make this devil thing seem good. No, but it is. I'm just like, ah! <laughs> Every- <laughs> still, <I'm> just like, Woo! <laughs> Every single card Woo! in the deck is good. It just, it's, it's because all of them are there to guide you to where you need to be. These two cards need to be turned upright and they can't be turned upright until this is addressed. Like what are the thoughts that we bind ourselves to? What are the thought patterns about, oh, I don't belong here. I don't have enough. Str-. Because notice the queen, Regal, had all of the power to manifest things in the physical realm the strength card there like you have all of the power to literally open because in the traditional deck we see um a, um a woman or a figure opening the lion's mouth but the lion is not resisting so it's a very leo card I, yeah yeah i think that actually on a more serious note mm. i've like been joking around but i think it is actually really important that i do have um, I do, and I know a lot of people do. Mm. Um, I do suffer from imposter syndrome mm-hmm. a lot. Um, I'm like, oh, people keep asking me to, I don't know, do this thing or mm. speak this thing. I'm like, why, why? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it is something that um, can really undermine your ability mm. to to perform. Um, and I definitely think it's something that I need to work on. And I think a lot of people do because I talk yeah. about it with some of my other friends yeah. and things like that. And um, I think it happens, as we know, to black women a lot. A lot. A lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. And I think that that's the energy. But because the major arcana card that came up for you after the devil card was a strength card, that just tells me that this is what you have been called to do. That's why you spent so long studying all of these things. Like this is what you have been called to do and there's nobody that can do it the way that you're doing it because you you have a particular way of of um operating and navigating this terrain that you are actually energetically made for but until those thought patterns you overcome them not even not even banish them because they they're still a part of us but find a way to let them coexist in the manner that they don't override what you're here to do, mm-hmm. then then it works better for you. Because the reason I say that, and it's very clear, is because the affirmation card that you pulled from the Say Your Mind card deck is putting myself first is healthy. We often believe that to constantly put others before ourselves makes us good people. While caring for others is important, we can only help others when we have helped ourselves. So again, the idea that, well, you know what? I, I don't feel like I belong here. So if I just keep giving and I keep giving and I keep giving, then it's okay. But what what giving back to you is important i think on that note um something that is really important <clears throat> is like relationships mm-hmm. so i came out of a like a long term relationship about a year ago mm-hmm. and i massively love companionship mm-hmm. like i think i thrive mm-hmm. um actually like in a in in a relationship however I also know that I'm massively more productive, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether my partner's supportive or Mm -hmm. not, outside a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, really important that men and women acknowledge Mm. that, you know, actually sometimes you're just better off on your own. I think people, yeah, yeah, it's not like a forever thing. And it's not like, I know there's this whole narrative that people try to make us seem like we're like, no, you don't need no man. I'll be, we're strong black feminists. I'm like, okay, sometimes you need a partner or... You, um, you need a partner and sometimes you just actually just don't it's yeah. actually holding you back and sometimes that partner needs to come back in like six months mm. if possible if they love you they need to take it <laughs> oh is that, is that a message <laughs> <to> that? <laughs> 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 baby come back but but it is true and it's it's knowing your vices and that's what the devil card speaks to it speaks to addictions it speaks to just in, in patterns and pa- patterns that um can overpower us and it's the fact that you are aware of that pattern that Th- those part of the vices you have to have time by yourself to really hone in on your own power because my god the shifts that will take place when you actually do take that into account that I need to put myself first because there are things that need to be achieved and they cannot be achieved while I'm still second guessing myself and waiting for t- t- for something else to make me whole when you're already whole and so then the cards that we pulled from the Marcella Kroll deck is earth Number 11, so I'll just see what she says about Earth. 
Number 11, she says here, the tangible world and all that is physical in nature, what you can see, feel and touch invites you to participate in enjoying it. Inviting in earth energy to your current situation will bring more stability at this time. Be kind to this temple of a physical body that is the home for your soul. It requires adequate nutrition and rest. Meditate on this symbol when you want more of a connection to the physical plane and a validation of all that is here in the three-dimensional world with you. Honor it, see it, feel it, experience it with love and respect. Oh, rest. Nice. Yeah, I, sh- I, I mean, as I, before we started, I was like, I've been coughing for like five months. I was like, what? Kelechi's like, oh my God. She literally was just going to clap out and die in the middle of the studio. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm not very good at that. Mm. Yeah, I'm not. I can't lie. Mm. If I have a spare moment, then I'm like, oh, maybe I should go for a cycle or to the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not very good at that. But resting, and I'm the same. I'm the same. But no, I I think that those cards are, they're lovely. They're lovely. When people see, for me, when I see the tower card, I'm like, fucking tower card. But everything always leads to good. And it's always the messages that we need to hear at the time that we need to hear them. So I'm just going to be quick then. So I know that we, well, I told you already that Annabelle Show and Mimo is my um, Share Your Magnificence for this week. Um, so you mad, people are mad generally, because I was going to talk about the, um, I can even mention it, the Airbnb. There was a family staying in an Airbnb and they discovered a camera in their smoke alarm. No Yes No Yeah and and Airbnb was sort of like Yeah well you know girl People discover cameras every day B And I just thought that that was wild It says here Family finds hidden camera Live streaming from their Airbnb in Ireland A family from New Zealand um, After arriving um, at their Airbnb in Cork Island A family from New Zealand Made an unsettling discovery A hidden camera live streaming from the living room um, Neely and Andrew Barker from Auckland were in the midst of a 14 month trip and around Europe. Wow, privilege. Uh, when they arrived at the Airbnb property with their four children and niece, once the family had unpacked, Andrew Barker, who works in IT security, scanned the house's Wi Fi network. The scan unearthed the camera and subsequently a live feed from the angle of the video. The family tracked down the camera concealed in what appeared to be a smoke alarm or carbon monoxide detector. It was such a shock. It was re- uh, just a really horrible feeling, Neely Barker told um, these pussy clerks. Um, she called Airbnb to report the camera. They had no advice for us over the phone, she said. The girl just said, if you, can- if you cancel within 14 days, you won't get your money back back. Next, Andrew Barker called the owner of the property. When confronted with the family's discovery, Neely Barker said the host hung up. Later, <laughs> later, he, later, he called back, insisting the camera in the living room was the only one in the house. I'm like, bitch, you, I, hung, I you just... hung up, you hung up, and then called back to tell me that, oh, that's the only camera. Now I don't believe you. It sounds like there are more cameras. I mean, the thing that this makes me feel is that I, I use Airbnb. Well, I haven't used it for like maybe a year or whatever, but when I go on holiday, I use it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, it makes me think that actually this is actually probably quite a common it's thing. Common. It's, it's common. common and none of us have actually even thought about it yeah. because actually if you're renting out your house or your home, you know, obviously I thought that some people might have like door cams, yeah. you know, you have those in the UK. It hadn't occurred to me that somebody would put a camera in in the house, but I think it must be very common, it's especially common with the expensive villas yes. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, you're worried about your property and some yeah. people actually leave quite nice things in yes. their house yes. from some of the yeah. houses I've stayed in. I'm like, they're probably... Are cameras in these properties? I think there are cameras even in hotel rooms. I know there are cameras even in hotel rooms. That's why we saw Donald Trump, how he was pissing on them girls. Like, um, we, we see everything. We, we see everything. Hotel rooms have them. And so I'm sure a lot of these Airbnb properties have them. They, they're they just lucky because they picked it up on a Wi-Fi network. Yeah. But if they'd set it up somehow where it wasn't even showing up on a Wi-Fi network, how would you know that you're being surveilled the, the whole time? No, and that's why most of us like have no... No idea, but I'm, I'm sure, sh- yeah, that's terrifying actually. That's- but fuck Airbnb, first of all, because how can people call you and say, fam, I just found a camera in the smoke? And, and also because you intended for it to not be detected. And it, because it, well, I st- if when- you put it on like a, you know, a shelf, or a canary. Like you, you, when, yeah. I, when I was in New York, I stayed at an Airbnb in New York, and that girl had um, a canary right in the middle of the rid- um, living room. So you knew it was a canary. Well, I knew my best friend, um, well, one of my really good friends, Magda- uh, Magdalena, she was chatting shit about the host didn't realize the canary was there so i had to be like it's it's, it's, chicken chicken so she gave her a terrible review after that but she had this canary 
right there in your face in the middle of the living room. So when you were walking through the living room, you knew that it was there. And I can't remember, but I think she had a sign also telling you that, hey, there's a camera. I in mean, this that's area. different because it's fine to write that there. But this key issue with this, isn't it? Is that you're not really supposed to record people without their consent that and their the knowledge. Thing. Right. You know, so Airbnb, like, you need to have a policy where you just say to your host, okay, hey, you're we're recording have, you. Or you're going to get thrown off Airbnb if you don't declare. Oh. To the, your your guests that you're recording them and you're found to have a camera, you don't get your payment. But, but what's interesting is after Airbnb simply said to them, oh, um, if well, so I'm telling you that someone's recording me. You go, well, if you cancel within 14 days, you're not getting your money back as if you don't care. So um, he says here, um, they didn't feel relieved by the fact that the guy said, oh, we've only got one camera in the house. And he refused to answer whether he was recording the live stream or capturing audio. The family relocated to a nearby hotel and called Airbnb the following day. They still didn't seem to grasp the seriousness of the issue. They were treating it like a cancelled booking, Neely Barker said. Ultimately, Airbnb's trust and safety team promised to conduct an investigation and it temporarily suspended the listing. According to Neely Barker, Airbnb did not contact the family again. After she got through to them two weeks later, the company told her that the host had been exonerated and the listing reinstated. So again, Airbnb don't the care. The thing is, I think in this day and age when we have technology developing like this, I think people don't really think about things. So obviously from a sexual health perspective, mm -hmm. I always think about these things mm -hmm. in these terms and I like <clears throat> have done safeguarding training and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But if you are recording people in an Airbnb, there's a chance there that you're recording children. Ah! Okay, and that is, that is very, very, that's that's illegal, potentially, yeah. depending on what the children are doing. Is somebody changing their child? Okay. You know, like you've now got child nudity that had like, you've got photographic images yeah. of children that, you're recording that, that are not your own. Yeah. Um, so I just don't think sometimes that people are thinking They're about not. like what the actual repercussions of what they are doing. Yes, you want your property to be safe, but this is why you have to tell people you're recording them and because you, actually you might be placing yourself in quite a precarious situation. Oh, the legality, the legality of it all. It says here, it was only after she posted about the incident on Facebook that local New Zealand news stations reported her experience that the host was permanently banned, she said. So um, the safety and privacy of our community, Airbnb told CNN, the safety and privacy of our community, both online and offline, is our priority. Fucking lies. Airbnb policies strictly prohibit hidden cameras and listings, and we take reports of any violations extremely seriously. Well, no, you didn't. Um, we have permanently removed this bad actor from our platform. Our original handling of this incident did not meet our high standards we set for ourselves and we have apologised to the family and fully refunded their stay. There have been over half a billion guest arrivals in Airbnb listings today and negative incidents are incredibly rare. And again, you're lying because I remember the Amsterdam incident where the girl was checking out late or something and the host threw her down the stairs in Amsterdam. I mean, I have had mostly positive experiences, but even myself, I've had some experiences that have been negative. Mm -hmm. And then also I've had experiences where where, you know, I've, I know a lot of black people have had this where s someone suddenly cancels on yeah, you and yeah. it's likely a racial issue, yeah. but you can't pinpoint it because it was all fine and available. And then yeah. they see your profile picture and they and, take it off. That's and why I get white people to book for me. And it, and it, and it disappears, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. But then at the same time, this is the problem is that sometimes you also don't want to put yourself at risk of hostility yeah. because you can get your white friend or partner, or whatever, mm -hmm. to book for you. And then you, you turn up, up yeah. and get thrown down the stairs yeah, or something. They threw, you know? they, they threw that so, girl down the stairs in Amsterdam all because so she was checking actually, out an hour late. Actually, I'd rather you just said no thanks. Yeah. I might have my suspicions. But then I also don't really want to give a racist my money. No. That's another thing. I'd I'm not, not. I'm not. I don't. Even if it's a very nice filler, I would I'd rather, rather not. I would rather not. <laughs> so that that's that for So You Mad. I wasn't even sure we were going to read it. But our final point for this week is obviously Straw of the Week, aka Suck Your Mum. And I'd like for the prison service in this country, primarily, I know that things are wild in other countries, but I'd like for the prison service in this country to suck their mum because um, there's a black woman who I'll talk about shortly who died after being left on her cell floor for 21 hours. And um, my issue with the news reporting on that is that they keep mentioning that she um, had HIV. 
and that she was diabetic, but they didn't want to use the word black, which I think also played a role and played a major role, not even also played the major role in why she was treated the way she was treated and, and then ended up dying. So um, diabetic prisoner, because that's how they wanted to phrase it. Diabetic prisoner died after being left on self floor for 20, uh, 21 hours. Annabella Landsberg, 45, who was also HIV positive, was restrained by four officers at HMP Peterborough. Now, my whole thing is that what's her HIV status got to do with what you've just said? You know, because they don't go on to actually m- mention that it's in, like it was imperative information for the rest of the body of the text. Her blackness, I feel like, would have been more important in that situation, but they failed to mention that. They use a picture of her wearing a gele and being all dressed up in um, Nigerian attire, but didn't talk about that. It says a diabetic prison inmate who died after being left on the floor of her cell for 24, 20, 21 hours was denied medication and called pathetic by a nurse and inquest as heard. Annabella Landsberg, 45, who was also HIV positive, was restrained by four officers at HMB, um, HMP Peterborough and was left on a concrete floor for almost a day without medicine or food before the ambulance was called. Landsberg was restrained on the 2nd of September 2017 after allegedly grabbing the legs of a prison officer during an attempt to administer medication. The mother of three, uh, mother of three was found unresponsive and so in her own urine the following uh, the following day. Prison officer Amy Moore, who found the inmate, told the jury in Huntingdon how duty nurse Leslie Watts threw water on Landsberg, saying, you haven't wet yourself, you've done that. Um, officers have been called to Landsberg, um, ho- officers have been called to Landsberg's uh, cell the day earlier uh, when she did not stand up to receive medication through an inundation point, Landsberg claimed she was having difficulty standing, but more believed she was being obstructive. She said her legs wouldn't work, so she couldn't stand up and she was reaching at the sink. She was kicking her legs about backwards and forwards. I thought she was trying to be difficult for staff, said Moore. When officers came into the cell, Landsberg is said to have grabbed Moore's legs. She said to have been kicking and wriggling towards the door. For at least 13 hours, staff compiled hour by hour logs and separate checks from outside the cell in which she, it was claimed that Landsberg was moaning and mumbling incoherently. However, nobody entered the cell or asked how she was until the afternoon of the 3rd of September. She was taken to hospital where she died on the 6th of September. Landsberg had fled to the UK following a gang rape in Zimbabwe and was arrested on antisocial behaviour charges in 2014. In a witness statement, her sister Sandra said her mental capacity and health deteriorated after she was diagnosed with HIV in 2007. Um, She added that she had Um, She had had migraines since her sister's death and wanted to ensure that no other prisoners died in similar circumstances. So, yes, like all of that, the the fact that they're mentioning the HIV, yes, 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 it's, it's definitely a part of it. Fine, cool. But for me, I still have a problem with the fact that nowhere there did they mention her blackness. I mean, that whole case, so I'd read about it beforehand um, and... I, you know, obviously the results of the inquest and whatever haven't come out yet, mm-hmm. but I just find overwhelmingly sad. And I think it's a lot of why I'm trying to do what I do. Mm-hmm. I just find it so disappointing. You're right that they didn't mention her blackness. And I think obviously <clears throat> that was likely a factor with her HIV positive status. I do actually think it was a factor yeah, because of the yeah. stigma and everything we talk yeah. about. I think undoubtedly there's going to be, you know, those biases from the start yes. where they're going to like, you know, people are still really ignorant yeah. about HIV and what it means in transmission. Mm-hmm. People not wanting to touch people. And I think and obviously, an aspect of her blackness plus that, that HIV. Yeah, yeah. yeah, would definitely have, ultimately, you know, I don't have all the, the medical information and the post-mortem results aren't out, mm. but it sounds like to me that that's a diabetic patient for whatever reason getting delayed Areas mm. because they're having probably a hypo. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's probably why she 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 it sounds like she's having some kind of delirium. She's mm. kicking, she's screaming, she's getting progressively more distressed that's and, it, and, the way that they and confused. Her, yeah. Um, and people are are ignoring her yeah. potentially is what happened. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you know, not all these things. Sadly, we don't always get the truth in the end. Because you went um, and called police. My is- issue was that they criminalised her for all of these factors that well that she didn't really choose for herself. Like, imagine you're trying to escape from something as as horrid as that experience, 
at only to find yourself in further danger. But this is the thing people don't take into consideration enough, the overlapping trauma that people are experiencing. You've been, you've had gang rape. You have now been a displaced person because oh. you've come into at an older age, yes. mind, a completely different country and environment. Yes. You are, it's, I think it possibly single mother mm-hmm. of three. Yeah. Um, you've now got HIV, uh-huh. which is deeply still stigmatized yeah. um, in that, in, in Zimbabwean community mm. by many people. She's obviously suffering from the mental trauma of that yeah. diagnosis. And she has a chronic illness of type uh, 1 diabetes, diabetes. Um, which requires, you know, strict treatment. Yes. Um, you know, otherwise, yeah, you can die if you don't adhere to your treatment. But they, um, they they have these logs. So you checked on her hour by hour and nobody thought, you know what, let's give her some food. Let's just go and like, and she was left in her own urine. So who did the, who was the one that checked in the hour when that happened and thought, you know what, it's fine that she stays there. And, you know, the, the staff or the prison warden or whoever mentions like, oh, well, it was the nurse that did it, but you were complicit because you 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 you, you were fine with and that. And to be honest, I think these are some of the things that we um, don't actually, I think feeds into our conversation yeah. earlier that we're not honest about. Now that kind of story, lots of black people listen to. Mm. They listen to how the nurse did whatever. Yeah. And they think medical professionals you're all trash you're Mm. all in it together Mm. and you don't have our best interests at heart Mm -hmm. and the cycle continues instead of us having an open conversation about how that you know that nurse shouldn't have been doing that or whatever obviously i don't have all the facts or information but Mm. that's the kind of conversations that need to come out of cases yeah, like this yeah. you know we just don't talk about it but the fact that they took out her blackness that the 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 um, journalist or whoever omitted her blackness from reporting that that is part of the problem as well because people are pretending like race doesn't play a um, play an, um, an issue Absolutely, i feel like yeah. had those same things had those same um conditions and, and limitations and challenges being put to um, um a white woman for instance um being a victim of gang rape um hiv positive um a single mother of three weeks we think um, a diabetic as well, type one diabetes, all of those things. However, they still wouldn't have received the level of care, I guess that, um, you know, um, somebody who they deemed as well would have received, but it would have still been better than this. I think the attitude, um, another interesting issue is that the fact that she is a black woman is why some of those things actually happened yeah. to her in the first place, oh, yeah. you know? Um, so admitting her blackness is a huge issue because the fact that she was, gang raped in, in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe yeah. is because she was a black woman. And then had to seek asylum <laughs> over here. Yeah. Um, and the fact that she contracted HIV, um, when we know um, statistically 80% of women accessing HIV services in the UK are from black community. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's yeah. because she's a black woman. woman yeah. um, and of the overlapping issues that black women face. So yeah, you know, it's a massive omission. It's a and massive. we're not having the conversations that we need that to have in the way that we so so them. so yeah so we're not being honest and that was my issue with reading it that yeah you know telling us about her HIV status definitely you know is imperative but at the time of reading it I was just like <laughs> I definitely feel like this was racial and it was gendered why is that not being mentioned at all and we're just talking about these other factors is it because you feel that people would find more humanity in you mentioning these things and not bringing race into it and not playing the race card is that a, it, sh- could that be an aspect of it? It could, but the other thing is, is that this also happens a lot, that people mention certain factors. Mm. Like, I understand the mention her diabetes mm. because it, as of what I mentioned, yes. that might possibly be yeah. what was going on there. But then the HIV you mentioned, but in the way that the article I mm. listened to anyway, mm. they they failed to actually go into any detail about the undertext was there, about how that would have impacted upon possibly leading to her death yes. you know which is the fact that HIV is still highly stigmatized yes yes you know? yeah, and yeah. people don't have enough training and that makes people reluctant to engage with certain yeah. people in case you know they get it or whatever and I think those nuances you know are never really articulated mm. enough so when you read it to be honest it just sounds like they're oh her, by the way she and, and, just, and, and she, and she and that also and, you actually, know, yeah and you that know? just kind of emphasizes it reinforces the stigma because yeah. it just seems like a pointless yes just, fact. here you go bye here you go and and, and 
Yeah, it, it just unnerved me. So HMP Peterborough, you can all suck your mums. Um, that nurse, you can suck your mum. And um, the 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 duty officer, you also, you can suck your mother. All of you can suck your mother, who I imagine to be Regina, um, the, the queen. That Go and suck your mother because you're Her Majesty's prison service. That's who you should go and suck. Because I think it's disgusting. It's, 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 it's vile enough that we're criminalised for having the same limitations and challenges that um, non-Black people have. But the fact, you know, they, they mentioned that the police was called so she's having an episode but you went and you were just like boom let me just call the police because her having an episode criminal 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 instantly so of course she's gonna act out because you know you you've now brought police into it what she, that would scare anybody um it, it's just wild that we're not afforded the humanity um, in so many situations when things like this are happening. And I think that that's why it was so important for Annabelle to join us on the show today to talk about these things because we need to put the humanity back into these services that are being offered, especially for black and brown people. Um, this is what we need to do. And I'm so, so grateful that you wanted, you know, to join us. If people want to holler at you, where can they find you? Um, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Um, so on Twitter, I'm at Socho Mimo, so S-O-S-O-W-E-M-I-M-O. -E <clears throat> um, and then there's at Decolonize Contraception. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's at Decolonize Contra with an S, no Americanisms, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. no Zs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also on Instagram. So if you like search um, hashtag Decolonizing Contraception with an S, um, we'll come up and we also have a website which is like www.decolonizingcontraception.com, yeah. um, which kind of goes into more detail about um, like the events that we have coming up and stuff like that. So we've got one on the 29th of yeah. April on LGBTQI non-binary identities um, amongst black and people of color, where we're going to be discussing some of the barriers. And we kind of use the, um, the, the panels to help fuel um, themes for further workshops mm. which act as safe spaces for like different groups so um, yeah come along if you're free it'll be 7 to 9pm it's free at SOAS thank you so so much so um, that's Annabelle who's uh, joined us today and as you know I'm Kelechi Okafor this has been SYM officially known as Say Your Mind unofficially known as What What that's right suck your mum if you want to send any letters through, let us know how much you enjoyed this episode. Send it to sym at kalechiokafor.com or hashtag say your mind pod and holler at me. Let's 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 really get chatting about all of the things that we've discussed today. In the meantime, keep yourselves um your genitalia lubricated and um, keep your elbows, you know, moisturized and your knees moisturized and make sure that your food is seasoned. Peace. It's the Ben's Brunani woman is Baby boys, baby girls, you need to hear this so Sit down, sit down, receive this realness Make sure your cup's ready for the tea We are go sippy, yo Hard time scrolling for your long truths You might learn something you never know Collect you find, and she's one of a kind Don't say you mind, say you mind